<laughs> hey everybody, it's Ken Davenport. I'm still laughing from our something to smile about from last night. If you missed it, go back and watch the replay with Janine Desori uh, and watch all the something to smile about at the end. The one on this island social distancing musical uh, parody is what still has got me laughing and has been had me laughing all day long. Thanks so much for being here. Welcome to the end of the second week of the Producers Perspective Live. I, it's been 14 days uh, since we started this. It's been only 15 days since I actually came up with this idea. Uh, I literally was like, you know what we should do? We should just email a whole bunch of really smart, famous, successful celebrity type people and see if they'll do this. And the amazing thing, and that's what's the greatest thing about this Broadway community that I'm so blessed to be a part of, Literally, as soon as we sent that email, pop, 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 pop. Yes, 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 I'll do it. Including from this guy, tonight's guest, uh, who will be with us in just a few minutes, one of the smartest business people on Broadway. He's got multiple Tony Awards, producer of Rent, Avenue Q, In the Heights, Drowsy Chaperone, just to name a few, not to show drop. Uh, and two shows from this season alone, Six and Mrs. Doubtfire, both very untimely ripped from the boards. Uh, six, it was going to be their first their first preview, or I think it was their first preview. Uh, and tonight was to be the opening night of Mrs. Doubtfire, but we'll talk all about that uh, with Kevin. He's got great insights on what uh, the business has in store for us, how to rebound. He's been a friend, a mentor, all those things. So stay tuned for that. Don't forget why we're here. We're here to raise awareness for a couple of things. One, the Actors Fund, which is doing great work right now. I've been hearing from lots of folks just about how hard they're working and how well they're going to be prepared to help for those uh, artists and members of our community who are in crisis right now. And we're also just trying to remind everyone to stay safe, stay healthy, and stay the heck home. They're now saying here in New York and otherwise, if you don't even have to go grocery shopping, don't go grocery shopping. Just try to avoid being out there if you can. Real crux time here in this country. So uh, where's everyone from tonight? Throw it in the live comments. And I am, go look, all the comments coming in already. Cricket, Daniel, uh, Mary, we'll save that one. We'll show that one for Kevin uh, when he's on there. He'll like that one. Uh, someone who saw six already, Drew back from Baltimore. Oh, Kathy, Kevin was a producer of the Meet Me and Say, look, that's amazing. That's amazing. Uh, what, so here's a question for you. Why, um, why, what show are you binge watching right now? Like, what are you watching right now that you would not have watched if it wasn't for the quarantine? Okay, watching from Lafayette, Indiana. Thank you. Welcome. So what television show or movie? I watched a little Toy Story one day today with my two-year-old. Uh, I've also been watching this one, Zoe's Extraordinary Playlist. Anyone watching this? It's a musical. You should watch it. Anytime musical gets into television, it's a very good thing. And it's got my good friend Alex Newell in it from Once on this Island. And my very, very good friend, the best man at my own wedding, Noah Weisberg. Go watch Zoe's Extraordinary Playlist. Uh, Ozark, yeah, I'm doing that too. Ooh, re-watching Entourage. Hunters, Mrs. Maisel, fantastic. But what I really love is now you're all watching me. And more importantly, you're going to be watching again one of those people who I think has a better perspective than anybody on this industry. Please welcome Mr. Kevin McCollum. Wow. Wow. That was that was impressive. Thank you. I'd love to meet him someday. He's you know like a terrific guy. You know what's really impressive is that beard of yours. What is that? <laughs> Listen, I'm uh, I, I'm a little late to be bar mitzvah, but I'm finally a man. I uh, I actually had could never grow a beard, and uh, because it would take too long to even look like I could. So uh, in this time, which I'm calling a time of recalibration and reflection, which has a lot of positives too, um, I th thought I'd just for my own sake just really embrace the things that uh, I can't control and not trying to just let things happen the way they happen. And if you don't shave, and then you're a male with a certain level of testosterone, this will happen. And uh, so I'm kind of, it's a daily reminder, like I have to let go of the things I can't control and find gratitude and appreciation in how sort of nature takes its course, you know? And uh, so I'm, 
I'm just enjoying the fact that I have no control. And this beard is an example of that. Will you continue to grow it until it's over? Will there be a ceremonial shaving day or is it I, the color of look? It's really, it's really not up to me. It's up to my wife and kids, how long <laughs> they can tolerate the Grizzly Adams look. And I keep saying, no, it's not Grizzly Adams. I'm just looking for work that John Hamm turns down. <laughs> So uh, I've been asking all of my guests where they were when the virus hit the fan, if you will, and when they knew things were going to get really serious. I would imagine that you were in a, <laughs> you were about to have your first preview of six. Is that correct? It was, the, op it was the opening night. The deposit had been paid. The shrimp had <laughs> been peeled. Uh, Tao was waiting for us. We were full steam ahead. I was in the middle of writing my, uh, uh, my uh, happy opening uh, night notes. Um, and, uh, you know, I knew we were fighting a headwind of perhaps some ticket sales. Um, but I got uh, summoned uh, to the league at around 1030 uh, that there was going to be a meeting at 12. And uh, and I went there and uh, and uh, it was clear that uh, the danger was too high that Cuomo was going to speak at two and he might decide to, you know, ask the theaters to stop performing. And, uh, and I, I basically said, look, I'll do what, what the industry feels we should do. Um, and listen, safety is first, you know, we don't want, we are, the shows are about showing up, entering as strangers and leaving as a family and, uh, mm -hmm. to be part of uh, a situation which put, put people in danger, you know, I wouldn't want to be a part of none of our shows would want to be a part of. So, it was the right thing to do to close. And I was grateful that he said five o'clock because if he had said seven o'clock, it would have been very confusing uh, to all the people who were coming to see mm -hmm. the shows. And so, uh, you know, uh, we did not have an opening night. Uh, we gathered uh, that night uh, and just had a toast and got home as soon as possible because uh, we didn't want uh, people congregating too long together uh, during this very, very complicated time. Mm -hmm. And you had this real double whammy of it all because being the very prolific producer you are, you didn't have one new musical opening the season. You had two. And tonight. You know, yeah, no, I'm definitely an overachiever when it comes to uh, 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 difficult decisions. Um, listen, uh, you know what? I, I, it's not a double whammy. It's actually a, a, a double sort of... Um, uh, you know what I look at is as a rebirth when we're when we're back uh, when yeah. we're back uh, doing shows. I have two great shows. I have two wonderful companies, and the shows are about um, survival, about overcoming, you know, insurmountable odds, and really, you know, you 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 every great musical must start on the earth and end in the heavens, and and both my shows have that arc. And at the end of the show, you just feel better that you know you got to see the show and you learned something about yourself because it's about finding your family against all odds. So both my shows, in fact, all my shows sort of have that DNA. It's something I really respond to. And uh, I love, you know, when you sing, and we all know this, who love musicals, it's all about stakes. You know, in many ways, I think musicals power are about stakes over plot. And uh, Six uh, and Doubtfire, even though Doubtfire has a lot of great plot and a great movie, what, what, what is really the authors have really done beautifully is they've truly raised the stakes about sort of what divorce means today. we we'll really put it in today's time. So it's the kind of shows after being isolated for so long and Six is about, you know, you come in competing, but you end as, hey, we're all pretty amazing women that made the world spin. And we're going to need a lot of amazing women helping the world spin uh, when we come out of this. How different do you think an audience's appetite for entertainment will change after this? Will they want something totally different? Will we see we want more joy in our musicals? We're the, we've had a number of years of real challenging shows on Broadway, some dark, the dark period, if you will. Uh, what do you think, Seth? For our future? Well, I only can really speak about my show, Ken. I mean, I know how hard it is to make a musical. And uh, I do feel that uh, the musicals uh, that, that, uh, that will survive, and, and I mean survive,
because um, it, it's going to be tough. I think I don't think it's going to be the kind of musicals. I think it's going to be when people feel safe to be in the theater. I think the great thing about Broadway is that it's always diverse. There's there's enough there's enough stories for everybody, and you know some people say oh they might want more escapism, they might want something else, and and I I'm really not uh, believing that as much as uh, what people can afford and who's going and who's buying the ticket. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful for some sort of, you know, treatment or a vaccine or things like that, because that's going to be really important uh, to everyone, whether you're going to see a Broadway show or going to work in your office. Um, you know, many of us, uh, ha you know, obviously we have our own families and our own friends, but we also have our parents or our aunts and uncles or our grandparents. And with the asymptomatic aspect of, of the uh, virus, um, it's a it's a challenging foe. This virus, and um, it's doing what it needs to do because it's you know, <laughs> all throughout time and humanity, these things have happened. Um, and with this technology, it just feels strange. We can't control it. And I think that's again back to the beard. It's like you know, I think if we embrace the things we can't control, we're going to be more empathetic uh, and. I will say both my shows are about empathy and love, and um, and I think that's going to be the tonic for our time. Whether it's a show, whether it's your uh, an employer, how you treat your employees, whether you're an employee, how you treat your fellow employees, whether you're the brother of a sister, or you know, just just we are so blessed to be able to breathe and against all odds, sort of live on this planet, and um, and it's our job to to make some changes in our lives um, as we come through this and. And if that happens with all the destruction and terrible things that can't be justified, there will be a path forward on how, how we live as, as a people and as a species. And it's, I'm a little shell shot, but it's a beautiful, beautiful statement. It's absolutely true. And a lot of people don't think producers would think that way, which is, <laughs> which is I love You know, producers, first of all, let me just say, producers are terrible people. We all know that. <laughs> No, actually, you know, remember producers, I mean, th th there's all kinds of producers. Um, producer is, is one of the most misunderstood word. Um, if you don't know the Oscar Hammerstein quote about what a producer is, just go look at that producer quote from, uh, you know, decades and decades ago. I don't know the exact year he wrote it, uh, but just if you look up Oscar Hammerstein, it is what is a producer. It, that's sort of my, my mission statement. And um, we have to have a childlike wonder. We have to have a sensibility of a gambler. And we also have to be a little nuts. And nuts in the way, not like doing bad things, but nuts in the way of what if this happens? What if we get everybody in a room randomly, given all their independent lives, and decide to move in one direction to tell one story? And it, oh, and by the way, it's going to cost a fortune. <laughs> But don't worry, because people are going to love it. And you have to believe, like, yeah, I think people are going to love it. And that's why I'm an innate optimist. And, um, and you know, I think, you know, my own personal life, um, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm an only child. My parents died when I was young. I moved in with my aunt and uncle, who were great people, and my, my cousin slash sisters, uh, Marcy Heisler and Eileen Heisler, and my extended family. You know, I, I realized life is not fair. But that's no reason to become a victim. And I think that's why I do what I do. I, I try to create a space where everyone can kind of have their dreams come true if they're willing to show up and put all their passion and love into it. And um, so money is the tool. Human beings are the destination. And I mean that with the cast and the crew and the orchestra, because I typically do musicals, but also the audience. So um, as a producer, I'm constantly, I always say to people when I give notes, I'm like, look, I'm not giving notes because I used to be an actor or I used to write or anything like that. I'm giving notes because I'm a really, really big fan and a great audience member. Mm -hmm. So I am your, I feel I'm your audience talking to you. So that, that's kind of how I think about um, why I do what I do. Uh, if I know Mary, she's digging up that quote right now and she'll throw it in the comments for everybody. Uh, okay. But Seeing that you, as you say, a producer's job is to get people in a room and get people moving in one direction. Obviously, we can't get people physically in a room right now. You've got these two musicals 
that I, without a doubt, I'm sure are coming back and will come back stronger than ever. And you'll come up with some way to raise the curtain in a very triumphant celebratory way, because I know you. Uh, but you've probably got, I mean, how many other shows in development? How do you keep this momentum going and everyone moving in that direction when half the people want to be like, you know what, I don't want to fucking do anything right now. I'll sit in my room and just eat pizza. Yeah, well, um, I'm lactose intolerant. So I, no, I'm not lactose. I just want, don't mean to make a joke about lactose intolerance. Um, but my actually, believe it or not, we're having pizza tonight because I was supposed to grill, but then I had this. So I said, I can't grill tonight because I'm speaking to Ken Davenport and, and, and the, the Broadway fans. And, and uh, I'm grateful for that. So we're making pizza. Um, oh, and by the way, I'm, I'm in Putnam County. Just, and, and I just want to say to everybody, like you said, don't, if you don't have to go to the grocery store, I want to say squirrel is delicious. <laughs> um, it's really simple to make. And if you, I have some marinade ideas, and again, so I never catch a squirrel I don't eat. Okay, I just want to say that. Just fry it. Um, you know, fry it. No, I, no, you don't fry it. You do not fry it. No. Do not fry it. Um, so uh, what was the question, Ken? The, the question was, how do you keep that momentum going uh, in a time like this when people else? may not well, want to? You know. you know what? It's not even – I have to tell you, the secret of this time is – I've been doing, before I got here, tonight was our opening night. It was supposed to be at, at, at 6.30 uh, um, uh, at the Sondheim Theater tonight, and we were going to uh, Pier 60 for the opening night. Um, so instead, I'm having pizza. But uh, what, what, we, what I did just now, and I just missed the last 10 minutes, was this reading. Uh, we read through the script tonight. It was uh, mm -hmm. the cast idea. and. and and so we read through the script and uh, it was just great fun to see a hundred people, you know, and, you know, Zoom doesn't let you sing over each other. So, you know, we had some tracks and we, we, we let the songs happen and, and everybody dressed up either in their opening night outfits or like this. And everyone just loved each other by against all odds, the theater is so live and digitally we, we just made it. Um, my two other shows that I've announced, they're actually in very, very deep development. And uh, by the way, Doubtfire had had its third preview. We were in rehearsal that Thursday when I went at five o'clock and said, yes. you know, everyone go home. Um, so we'd only had three previews. So they just got their stuff and, and, and left. Uh, but my other two shows uh, besides Six and Doubtfire uh, what are uh, the Devil Wears Prada, and uh, we worked on a new draft, and we did a reading of that last week, and uh, through the internet, and it was just terrific. Because also you can focus a lot more. Usually you're kind of running from a reading, and then you got to go, and you got to do this, and you got to go to a show, and you got to go to a meeting, and 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 what's interesting about this downtime I've noticed is the artists specifically, the writers. Uh, there's just one of the things writers often don't have is time in the modern world yeah. and um and the work that's being done on prada is is, is tremendous and uh and we got to work with the actors we had cast sort of ready to go to chicago and that was wonderful and then also we're planning uh, we're going to the we're going to chicago at the the uh, chicago shakes for we've announced for the notebook that michael greif is directing and ingrid michelson and Rebecca bronsteiner is writing the book and ingrid's the music and we're, we're working on that now and, and we've had some some uh, some auditions remotely and, and we're just working. And on another project, I have, a, you know, a composer has sent me a song every three days that is just marvelous. And wow. I, I think what's happening is there's going to be so much pent up creative energy uh, that's going to be ready to be released to the world. I think it's going to be a very, very dynamic time uh, in theater um, once we're ready to open the doors. And, and the question is, we're going to have to, we're going to, have to do a lot of things. Um, you know, restaurants are going to have to come back first. There's going to have yeah. to be some time to build in advance. Um, we have very, very mature, um, mature uh, financial, uh, uh, you know, uh, just, realities to bring a show to Broadway because we're in New York, it's an expensive city and, and people should should earn a good living. But we all might have to sort of take a take a, a new look and a philosophy of okay, how do we how do we regroup for the first twelve weeks or sixteen weeks? I, I'm not really sure, but that's why I have the beard, because I really know nothing.
How, how long do you think it will take for us to get back to where we were? Well, I, I think it, it, unlike, you know, people are comparing this to 9-11, of course, it's nothing like 9-11 because uh, 9-11 happened in one place and it was a terrible, terrible thing. And, and our economy had shifted. We had gotten a dose of reality of how dangerous the world is in our time. And, um, and it was an act of defiance and, and, and taking care of the United States by coming to New York and seeing a show and buying, eating in our restaurants. Well, now everybody, everybody is part of this. And, and as a result, I think I'm hopeful the world will be kinder after we get through this. Mm -hmm. And number two, because again, the virus is more powerful. Nature is more powerful than any political thinking and any <sighs> land grab and any dictator. Um, and uh, that's a good lesson for humanity to realize. Um, so I, I'm a, I believe that shows will come back. Uh, there will be shows that come back sooner than later, and that's okay. I think there'll be a ramp, and it will almost be like an airport as we're getting the planes to land uh, again. We'll be getting the Broadway shows flying again. I love it. Let's go to some questions from the crowd. First of all, there was one here that I'm trying to find where, where is my it? only fear is like uh, this, this, this live stream is going to be the least amount of people watching because I'd much rather watch Janine Tesori or Alex oh, Cricket. Here it Sierra is. Bogus. <laughs> Cricket Daniel at 8, 10 PM, just so you can have some positive affirmation, Kevin. Mary, can you throw that up there for Kevin to see? Cricket Daniel says, I, oh, that's not it. Dang it. I, I, I like to read a script. Beard. Is that what that's like? I like the beard, he says. I keep it. Keep uh, the beard. That's great. Thank you, Cricket Daniel, who doesn't look like a cricket or Daniel. Uh, let's, uh, oh, he, yeah, he wants you to read some of his shows as well. Well, you got time in your great. We'll, yeah, we'll send it to Putnam County. Um, if you know Ken um, Davenport, if you know Ken Davenport, you can probably get me a script. Here's Adam Maggio asks an interesting question about this ramp up, actually. Uh, Adam asks, do you think in an effort to keep operating costs low in anticipation of smaller crowds, we'll see more plays than musicals opening when Broadway is back open? Do you think the plays are better suited for a return or are the musicals better suited? I'm just going to say it again. It's never about money. It's about human beings and it's about story. <laughs> and if it's a great play, absolutely. If it's a mediocre play or a play that, you know, there's a lot of great, great playwrights writing for television right now. And there's a lot of, you know, we're getting used to getting so many of our stories digitally now, uh, even more than before. Um, we just have to have enter live entertainment that reflects the culture we're in. So I think our stories might be different. I think uh, stories about plays about isolation and then entering the world might become a trend. But I don't think it. I don't think plays versus uh, musicals. One of the issues with plays are most plays today need stars again because there's so many other great narratives about music on television and elsewhere. So my my thinking is that um, no, because plays also need stars. And what will happen is is some of the great plays we had coming in. We don't know the availability of the stars if they're going to need to do some film and television right after. Mm -hmm what the contracts are. Again, I only can speak for my shows, but this idea of suspend and extend, which is the concept of, you know, if it's three months, you'll give us three months after your contract. Well, that's fine, perhaps, if it's a musical that has year contracts or longer. But, but plays sometimes with stars are 16-week commitments. Otherwise, they're not, they're not available. Now, I know that most stars who do Broadway love Broadway, and I know they'll do everything they can to have the show go on at some point. And I know most producers who produce plays, and I produced Hand to God and a few others, weren't star driven, but, but I, I'm really about promoting new playwrights. That's kind of my mission. Playwrights and librettists and lyricists and composers and directors. Um, so I, I don't think it's that simple. Um, and I'm not that cynical. I'm not, it's not about money. It's really not about money. It's about what reflects the world we're in and then you'll find the money to go see it and produce it. I just want to say one of the very first blogs ever written was about Kevin. Uh, and 
this non-star approach and this commitment to new writers. And, uh, you know, Hal Prince very famously said to me in, when I was uh, coming up, Ken, if you want a show to happen, get me to direct it. He was saying, like, you know, get great staff. And, of course, the shows would happen if Hal would direct it. But what I love about uh, what your first several shows were, Rent, Avenue Q, In the Heights, there was a commitment to Broadway debuts by the book writer, lyricist, composer, director, which flies in the face of conventional wisdom, but all one, made successes. Well, one show that I think sums up kind of what I believe in is the show about that, which is called Title of Show, mm. which is can you do a Broadway musical with four people and a piano and sometimes Larry? And the answer is yes, because invest in your friends. Do shows with your peers, you know? I understand Hal's comment, and, and he's a great man and, and, and very kind to me and, and many others in my generation, and we learned a lot from him. But there's no such thing as a slam dunk. What is true in the theater, though, unlike film, is that theater has more success when you don't think about formula. Whereas in film, because it's, a, it's, a, it's an impulse buy, uh, and uh, it's about getting out of your house when you're younger, and it's you know driven by youth, not a 65-year-old woman living in Connecticut, which is the, the theater goer, we, that imaginary theater goer we think of who buys the tickets for herself and her family. Um, it's really important. Theater is about surprise. And because it's visceral, because you're like seeing something with other people that you didn't expect. And everybody has to show up. And this is what frustrates me from new producers, or we had a lot of people who in our business who are producers who come from the financial world and they know what they go to, but they go to what their broker says is a hot ticket or, or they approach it very uh, outside in. Because I was an actor, I approach everything from inside out. How am I gonna feel? This should not work. If it's an, un, you know, Cricket Daniel, if that was the person who wanted to read the script, if it's a very non-commercial idea, meaning we just haven't seen it done in that way before, I'm interested. If it's, hey, it's this show meets Legally Blonde or this show, and again, these are great shows, but if you start doing it's this meets this to me, you belong in the film business or you go find someone else to produce your show. If you're like, I don't know if this is gonna work, but I loved it, sign me up. Hmm. Eli Van Sickle at 825 asked, question for Kevin. Oh, this is interesting on the heels of movie, the movie industry coming into Broadway. Can you talk a little bit about how Alchemation came to collaborate with 20th Century Fox? So talk a little bit about that yeah. partnership. I, I will a little bit. And um, it's again, it's a, it's a businessy question, but just I'll give you some just highlights. They were interested in having their library. They were licensing to a lot of different producers. And they came to me and said, would I be interested in, in working with them, figuring it out, maybe taking a few titles? And I said, the problem with you licensing to different producers is typically you'll take the best deal. But I can't afford your deals because the underlying rights are so expensive. And it's a movie and there's that, that doesn't necessarily help because expectations are high. And the key for a hit is your expectation has to always be lower than your reaction. Hmm. So if your expectations are high, it has to be perfect. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's one of these things that I was very skeptical that I would be the person. But then I started thinking about it and I said, if you, if you let me sort of pick a few titles and here's the deal, most of these uh, film companies would license and then have a right to put in money later. But I said, let's make a joint venture. Let's not, I don't wanna be a licensor. I wanna be your partner. So we made a deal where basically I was their partner. And I said, and guess what? Don't pay me anything. I'll raise money for my side. I'll meet you half. You put in half, I put in half from day one. And let's go forward as partners and it'll be self-policing because I'm not taking a salary. So you know I'm not doing it to try to just earn my weekly check. And, and, and it'll also be good for you because I don't have as much money as you, nor would I ever. And so if I'm willing to do it, why wouldn't you? given my track record. So it, we, we, Bob Cohen, who was at Fox at the time, and, and also Jim Giannopoulos, who ran the studio at the time, great, great people who just loved 
uh, the idea of really being partners because there at Fox was a very artist driven. I'm just talking about the studio. Of course, I want to be very clear. I was working with the studio, uh, not with the news and uh, uh, as a result, uh, we, we really developed some great stuff. And of course, the merge with Disney, I have to say Disney and Tom Schumacher have just been great uh, honoring that partnership and saying, you know, Kev, you know, we have our shows, you go do your shows and, and we'll be there in support. And so the deal continues and uh, Doubtfire, uh, we did Dire of a Wimpy Kid and we're going to do that again as well uh, uh, a little later. And then we have Doubtfire and uh, Prada and Night in the Museum and, and a few others. So um, for the next seven years, I'm going to be very, very busy. And, and again, the key is on doing these, why does it belong on stage? And those people who saw the first three previews of Doubtfire will see what we're doing. We're not done with the show yet, of course, because we're in our third preview and our extended hiatus. And, <laughs> uh, and we'll be back. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just very, very grateful for that. So it came out of just a few conversations over about six months. And they hadn't had anyone saying, I'll, I'll be your part. I, I, I'm not just trying to license something for 25,000 for the first 12 months and let's see who I can attach. I worked with them very closely and we, we built, uh, we built some great teams and, uh, Doubtfire are the guys who I did uh, something rotten with. So, uh, and of course, Prada is Elton John and, uh, never heard of it. And others. Yeah. And, uh, it's in Shane and it's just great. It's just uh, really wonderful. And of course we have great directors and Jerry Sachs and Anna Shapiro and, and we're working on, uh, on uh, Night in the Museum, and uh, Alan Menken announced it already. So I'm going to announce that you know Alan did uh, is, is is writing the music for that. So and that's going very well, and he's written some fantastic stuff. Well, can't wait to see them. Some of uh, the crowd here has already seen. I'm reading a couple comments. Now, go see Six when it returns. It's really sweet, and the crowd is full of love for the women. Um, there was someone else who saw the one of the first previews of Doubtfire and loved it as well on here. Uh, so when they return, everyone go see those two shows and look out for, I mean, the slate of yours is ridiculous. Night at the Museum, Notebook, Prada, and many, many more. Thank you so much for being here, uh, for you, doing Kevin. what you do. And, we will and I want to thank your audience who took uh, a Sunday at 8, or if you're watching this on Monday or Tuesday, or even three years from now, when uh, all the shows are up on the boards and still running. I'm just grateful that you love coming to the theater, and uh, if we show up together, we can change the world. A great way to say goodbye. Keep growing that beard. <laughs> Thank you. We'll see you soon. Kevin McCollum, everybody. A great guy and a fantastic producer, a fantastic producer for anyone looking to uh, learn how to produce. Just watch the guy's career. Just take a look at all the stuff that he's done. Uh, or if you are looking to get a producer, there's no one better, no one better. Uh, so thanks so much to Kevin for joining us tonight. Uh, we're going to keep going with this thing. Tomorrow night, show the lineup for tomorrow night. Who do we got tomorrow night there, Mary? Susan Blackwell tomorrow night. Susan Blackwell from Title of Show. God, it's like Mary planned this. I should have told Kevin. Kevin, if you're watching, Susan's on tomorrow. Uh, Susan Blackwell from Title of Show, fantastic. She's got an incredible podcast as well. Super funny lady, super smart. She will inject you with a shot of happiness for sure and joy. That's what she does. Uh, Susan, tomorrow, a whole bunch of other people coming up for the rest of the week and the rest of the next several weeks. Flash that uh, graphic. Look at all those fancy people. George Costanza is coming on. Mary Lou Henner is coming on. Uh, it's going to be a great couple weeks here at the Producers Perspective Live. Don't forget the Actors Fund. Don't forget stay healthy. I get my own, ta I get my own hashtag wrong. That is the, by the way, that is the sign of a bad hashtag. When you can't remember it and you came up with it. Stay safe, stay healthy, stay home. Don't forget about that. And now our, my favorite part, something to smile about. We always leave you with one thing. This one comes from Kevin himself and the incredible cast of Mrs. Doubtfire. Uh, they have a big tune in that show called As Long As There Is Love. And they recorded it just for all of you. They did it using social distancing, all of them in separate places. We're going to throw that link into the chat. You heard Kevin say he was nervous that not a lot of people were gonna watch this. We know a lot of people are gonna watch this. Watch this, show him how many people can watch this video. Watch it, share it. It's a great song, it's a great message, and it will make you smile as, as long as there is love and then go see Doubtfire and Six and all the other shows when they come back because they will be coming back. 
And we'll be back tomorrow. Producers Perspective Live. Thanks so much. Signing out.